It's an annual event that we hold in September every year. Um, amateur or professional gardeners bring along their seeds and they can pick up other varieties that they're looking for. So it's a really exciting area to be in here. Um, this is the seed swap table. So we're involved in um, processing the seeds that people bring in and then we can actually make other seeds available for people to collect. We've had people asking for quite unusual things. So um, things like red persilla that I've never heard of. That, someone's already looking for um, wild garlic things like that so yeah we get a lot of variety and we're well armed with our botanical books to make sure we can find the species that people are looking for we're accepting all sorts of garden species and whatever seeds they have in the back of their sheds that they think oh I'm never going to grow that so they can bring them along and choose other things to grow. It's really important to try and keep some of the vegetable varieties alive that we're starting to lose in our British gardens. So um, a lot of varieties we've just stopped growing because they're not commercially viable. You can't find them in garden centres. And yet at seed swaps like this, we're finding really interesting things coming through and we're encouraging gardeners to use very simple technology to dry their seeds safely and keep them alive and then be able to keep using those seeds year after year or exchange them at seed swaps like this. Now here in the seed bank what we have is a sophisticated drying facility which actually dries them down to about 15% relative humidity and then once they're dry they're sealed up and put into minus 20. And under those conditions, they will last 20, 50, 100 years or more. Now, at home, you perhaps don't want to go that ex no. to that extreme. But if you can follow the same principles of drying them down and then sealing them up and putting them somewhere cool, they will last a long time. And even packets of seeds, when you buy them, you know, they come in a little foil sachet. As soon as you open them up, they start to pick up moisture. And when their seeds start to pick up moisture is when they start to die. Using something like the mini seed bank where you can dry them and store them, um, you can keep them from year to year. What you're doing in effect is providing a dry environment so that when you put the seeds inside, that dry material sucks the moisture out of the seeds and makes them last longer. The only downside to these sort of techniques is you don't know how dry your seeds are. So if you can imagine you've got your cat litter or your rice and you put it in the oven, that is as dry as you can get. If you then put a small container of seeds in there, it sucks them dry and they very often will actually die because of that. But if you were to put one of these sachets, little green sachets, in with your seed and then put that into your dry environment, the dry air dries your seeds and when that starts to turn orange, you know that that is now dry. You put the lid on with the little now orange sachet in it seal it up, puts that somewhere cool and this will then tell you if that starts to leak because if any moisture gets in there that'll start to turn green again. You can dry them down and they will then last potentially 10, 20 years, you can get even longer, it depends on the species. I've worked since 2001 as a seed development fieldsman working with farmers and with gardeners saving their own seeds. And it was especially in 2004 that I really understood where we were at with the whole seed issue, seed question. Because that's when I learned that open pollinated seeds were disappearing very fast and they were being replaced by the hybrids. Four companies own 56% of the seed market today. So that's a very large portion of the seed market. It's all really done because of economical reasons. You control the world's food supply by controlling the world's seed supply and they know that and that's what they're doing basically. There's new EU legislation coming in to strengthen their hand and we're trying to organise ourselves as well as European groups to counteract that. Hybridisation is also a natural phenomena when two more different types cross and they produce a third more vigorous, stronger plant. Hybridisation has been taken from the observations of hybridisation in nature so we're basically just manipulating that in an extended way. When you're up and running with those lines, then no one else can actually repeat that. Open pollinated seeds 
are reproducible, are non-patented, and that means that then they're free for anyone to reproduce. And they will breed through the type. And that's the beauty about open pollinated varieties. That's why farmers in the world, all over the world, in the past, were able to develop varieties wherever they lived, in their location, in the lowlands, up in the mountains, you know, in, in, in warm climates, in cooler climates, the plants will adapt and then you save the seeds accordingly, you know, the, the ones that have survived the best. And that's how we've had this fantastic diversity, which we've actually, we've lost 75% of, uh, of genetic diversity since about 100 years. This was announced in the meeting in Rio 1992 when that was declared the world had lost 75% of its genetic diversity. You can't do seed saving properly unless you're using open pollinated seed. The most commonly used seed you buy today from the garden centres is F1 hybrid and you can't reproduce, you can't save seed from the F1 hybrid because the seed companies retain the two parents which produce the F1 hybrid in the first place. You've got to go back year after year like the commercial growers to buy new seed from the seed companies. Um, What's coming in now which is even um, is going to overtake F1 hybrid is what they call transgenic seed and they, they'll basically now just reproduce once and then just die. So there's no way that you can save seed from that. So if you're going to breed a new variety, what are you going to get for it if the farmer can keep sowing, you know, harvesting those seeds? So, so they had to find a mechanism by which that process would stop, that the farmers would keep saving the seeds. And that they have managed. And especially with the vegetables, has this become very successful. Whereas in the past, Food production and seed production happened together. Today, it has been separated. You've just got food production and you've just got seed production. That means that those who are producing food don't know how the seed is produced. That you had all in one about 100 years ago. Most of the seed you buy in the UK is not grown in the UK vegetable-wise. It's grown abroad. So what we're trying to promote is for people to grow and save seed in the UK which our climate's not ideal for it, so it takes a bit of, it's a bit of a challenge, but it can be done. He's swapping seeds with us. He's got over 200 varieties of tomato he's got in his collection, and so he's coming and swapping some of the uh, tomatoes for some of the seeds we've got, which is the whole spirit of, of a seed swap. And someone else I know has 180 French bean varieties, so yeah, and uh, they do start to get a real interest in certain things. I mean, if you think about it, originally everyone saved seed because, you know, if you go far and far back, there wasn't seed companies. It was just you save your own seed or you don't have any seed. And um, we're just trying to bring that skill back um, so that people can it's, get rid of that esoteric sort of thing. Oh, some people say, you can save seeds from vegetables? Well, that, yes, that's, that's the whole thing. That's how they've been doing it for years, thousands of years. My grandfather farmed on the west coast of Ireland and he religiously kept his own vegetable as well as cereal seed year after year. That generation did, as you know, and previous generations before. And we lost, we lost that ability to seed save around about that time. And you ask yourself, why, what happened there? It's really the onset of cheap fossil fuels, which brought in the age of mechanised farming, the age of the supermarket, which replaced your local greengrocer. Then the supermarkets demanded from the growers vegetables which were uniform in appearance that could travel long distances. In 70 273, they decided that to sell seeds, they, were, they produced a national list. This national list meant that all varieties had to be registered and they had to be tested. Uh, and what that meant is obviously there's a cost. And what our founder, Lawrence Hills, noticed, lots of varieties started to disappear. So he started to collect them. And we've been doing that ever since, and we've got about 800 varieties. Uh, and the reason we do a membership scheme is that legally we can't sell those seeds. So we sell you a membership scheme and you get free seeds. Um, so it's our sort of way of not selling seeds. You know, we talk about sustainability. You can't say you've got local food security unless you've got local seed security. That's the bottom line. And you can't say you've got local seed security unless you're using open pollinated seed, which you can reproduce from year after year. That skill, that knowledge, is only sitting with the seed companies. So you can say they are directing the show, they're steering it, they're steering our nutrition. So if they want genetically modified seeds that many people are not happy about, what is our choice?
first thing is to show you how to save your own sea. Learn that for, and also what that, what that does for you helps to build build the resilience back in back into yourself and also the the community um, to be independent to know how to grow your own food really. Because the plant will adapt to whatever environment it's in, therefore you get this what's called genetic diversity. This genetic diversity is getting completely lost in the hybrids because the hybrid is is non-recoverable. It's actually an evolutionary dead end. You have to keep going back to the two lines that produce the hybrids and that only the companies can do that. So if you buy a hybrid seed, you won't be able to recover that particular hybrid that you're growing in your garden. And what does that, what does that mean? In, in your children's lifetime, they won't be able to save their own seed because all that open pollinated varieties will be off the market. So if we don't take a stand now, our children won't be in a position to save their own seed. What I like about seed swap is that people are actually not just swapping seeds, it's the stories and telling them, oh, like some of our volunteers, it's, oh, this is how I've grown it, or you want to try this, this is how you prepare it. So it's not just about, here's some seeds. It's not just a, a product I'm giving to you, but I'm giving you the story, I'm maybe even giving you a recipe, I'm giving you some advice on how to grow it. And so, yeah, you get that sort of interaction you don't get from a seed catalogue, even ours, although we have stories and things in it, it's a personal thing, which is good. You get that connection. We've basically got to stop those open pollinated varieties from disappearing altogether. We're sleepwalking into this disaster, and that's why it needs to be more publicly um, recognised and, 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 and know what's happening. And, and we're working on that. We're working on that. All right.